Contact. Don't we'll worry about contact. Okay, let's look at a couple other passages. As long as we're in Romans, flip over to the end of the, the, the epistle. In the Byzantine lectionary cycle during Lent, this is the reading. Now, the Byzantine tradition, also in the West, uh, traditionally, you give up. Lent was a very severe fast. You give up meat. And this is read on the pulpit. Romans chapter 14. As for the man who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not for disputes over opinions. One believes he may eat anything. Well, the weak man eats only vegetables. <laughs> What'd you guys eat on Friday? Hmm? What'd you eat last night? <laughs> now imagine you're even fasting for a few weeks into Lent from meat. The church is telling you this is a good thing. This is traditional. And then you read this. My friend, he's pretty weak. I know he had a steak last night. He gave up on the fast. But here I'm said to be the weak one because I eat only vegetables. So, how many of you have heard this passage before? The weak man eats only vegetables. Please. It's in the, it's in the Roman lectionary cycle, too. Were you praying your rosary during the Mass? What was going on? Reading the bulletin? There's a column in the bulletin. I'd ignore that during the, during the All right. So, the weak man eats only vegetables. What's that all about? What's vegetables have to do with St. Paul? All right. Well, there's a lot of other passages we can look at. But as you dive into the Pauline epistles, if you're a Catholic, maybe never, if you ever do decide to dive into the Pauline epistles, or if you ever had, you'll find that you're immersed in all sorts of historical and cultural situations that you're not privy to. Why? Because Paul's epistles were not designed for you to pick up, go down to Walmart, grab a Bible off the shelf, buy it for five bucks, Go home and start opening up and read it through the New Testament. And then you come to Paul's epistle, Romans, and you start reading. Strange. Remember the first time I read Romans? I got to that passage. My Calvinist friend must be right. <laughs> Paul says it right there. And I kept reading. Vegetables. What's going on? So the problem is that we're reading Paul's epistles completely out of the historical context. Paul never intended, when he wrote Romans, for you to pull out a book out off Walmart, out of Walmart, go home and read it. That wasn't the way he was expecting you to come across his epistle to the Romans. In fact, his epistle to the Romans was written to solve a particular problem for a particular pe group of people in the church in Rome. With names, people running the coffee social, bringing the donuts on Sunday. They don't donuts, but all that stuff. There were, there were, it was a real parish, a real church in Rome. Paul mentions them by name at the end of the epistle. If you don't know who they are, and you don't know the historical context of the dilemma that Paul was dealing with when he wrote that letter off to the church in Rome. You can forget understanding that epistle, and you end up as a Lutheran. <laughs> Alright, so what we're going to do today is try to just give you a framework, historic, a little bit of a historical setting, and a framework and a plan of action of how to read through Paul's epistles this year. Remember, this is the year of St. Paul. Right? Who loves the Pope? Huh? Well, if you love the Pope, and he loves you, don't you think you should read the epistles? <laughs> now, if you love God and God loves you, you'd not hope you'd read the whole Bible, because that's his book. But we'll start with the epistles. Okay, so turn to your uh, notes there on St. Paul. We'll look at some basic historical information. We're all on the same page. <laughs> Paul the man. Who was he? Where did he come from? Saul or Paul, wherever there it is. 
So two names, Saul or Paul. Sometimes you hear popularly in discussions of Paul that his name got changed when he had his conversion experience. That's not the case as far as you can be discerned from the text or from any of the early patristic interpretations of it or the traditional interpretation throughout the last 2,000 years of the passage. But rather, as you see chapters later, all the way, chapter 13, this conversion happened in chapter 9, and chapter 13 of Acts is where you start to see Paul's name being switching from Saul to Paul. And it's most likely in the narrative of Acts happening at that moment because Paul's moving from his mission to the Jews or his, his cultural setting out into the mission of the Gentiles, that moment, that chapter. Well, why would he switch names? Going to recover? Witness protection program? No. In the ancient world, and even happens today, when you live in a culture that is not your own or a linguistic setting which is not your native tongue, oftentimes you're, you have a name for you know what the people call you at home or when you're out in the world. Sabatino. I never grew up talking to a Sabatino. Right? His name's Tino. Because right? that's the Sicilian shortened version of that name. So in the family, that's what he's called. So, but someone called Tino outside of that setting, Tina, then you have a fight in third grade, and that's the story. So, you have different names. People have come from different cultures and come, and come into different, you know, um, well, who was not born in the United States here? What's your name? Joe. Joe. Where are you from? Lebanon. Lebanon, Joe. That's what you were called in Lebanon, Joe? No. Yosef. 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 What's that do with Joe? Yosef, Joe. Well, it's the same name. But you see that in, now in his family, when people talk, Yosef, they talk to him. But if he said, hi, uh, walks up to uh, someone here for a job here in America and says, I'd like to have a job, or what's your name? Yosef. Excuse me? <laughs> Yusuf. So, the name, you'll see a lot of times in the New Testament different names depending on the culture and the, and the language. Now, Joe and Yusuf are the same name, linguistically, but in, uh, from the etymology and the, the history of it, but sometimes you have a completely different name. You know, the name is some long name. Uh, they come from China. They have some very beautiful long name that means something beautiful in Chinese. They come here and they switch to Joe, right? Or something like that. So. Date of birth. We're told that uh, in Acts that Paul was a young man. Uh, young man at the time of the stoning of Stephen, Acts 7. By the time of writing a flame on an, old, uh, an elder man, an older man. So most people would date his birth somewhere between 5 to 15 AD. So born sometime shortly after the birth of Christ. Where was he born? Not Palestine. He was born in Tarsus, originally a, uh, a, an area of strong Semitic culture, but by the time Paul is born there, Tarsus is a major center of colonization, of culture, uh, Hellenic culture. It's also extremely important uh, administratively from, from the standpoint of the Greek Empire and then also the Roman Empire. So Paul grew up in a, in a culture that is, is uh, a mixture of the Semitic background in which he lived, but also the education, the government, everything, the school system was all Greco-Roman. So he knew Greco-Roman philosophy and, and rhetoric and how the culture and the government worked. And so we oftentimes you'll find him using that to his advantage. Jerusalem residence. Paul moved from Tarsus to Jerusalem sometime before the martyrdom of Stephen. So if you look on your map there, either one, Tarsus or Tarsus should be on. Uh, Tarsus is on the white one, I know. Which one go left? Look on your white map. You'll see if you find over the bottom right hand corner, you find Jerusalem. Then travel up the coast through Lebanon, Phoenicia, and then you get to Antioch. And then you come around the corner on the coast and you get to Tarsus. Okay? Tarsus is on your map, on the on the white map, on the very right hand is center. You see Cilicia or Galicia? So he moved from Tarsus down to Jerusalem. When did he do it? 
sometime around the public ministry of Jesus, probably afterwards. He doesn't seem to have had any direct contact with Jesus in his public ministry. And this is Paul who confronts Stephen and the Christians and has him stoned. You would expect Paul would have been on the front lines. Crucify him. Crucify him. So there's no indication that he was there in Jerusalem at that point or that he had that direct contact with Jesus. He may have been, but we don't know that. He doesn't tell us that. There's no indication in the New Testament for the condition. So... You would assume from the lack of that information that probably sometime after the crucifixion resurrection, Paul moved down there. Okay. Religious affiliation. A Pharisee. How could you say that? Either in Tarsus or after moving to Jerusalem, Paul joined the Pharisees and studied under Gamaliel, a very important teacher in Jerusalem. Mentioned in Acts 22 by Paul as his teacher. And the way he mentions that I studied under Gamaliel is clearly an indication that Gamaliel was a very influential teacher at the time. We know from other historical information that that was the fact. And then there's a Gamaliel, which is uh, many would take to be the same individual who appears in Acts chapter 5. And you can see his influence there. The word Pharisee is oftentimes misunderstood in the modern reading of the New Testament. When we think of Pharisee, we usually think of self-righteousness, hypocrisy, the story of the publican and the Pharisee. Right? Another reading that comes up in the Eastern lecture, I know during Latin, to prepare you so you don't become a Pharisee. All your fasting. So, what do we talk about a Pharisee? Well, the word Pharisee, as we have in English, comes from the Greek word, which is a transliteration of the Hebrew haperashim, which means the separated ones. And the separated ones doesn't mean hypocrisy. It just simply means they saw themselves as separate from the rest of the culture, including the rest of the Jews. For the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, these were religious and political in many ways parties of the period. What are you? I'm a Republican, a Democrat. What are you? Oh, I'm, a, I'm the Green Party. The way political parties work in America is very similar to the way the religious parties were in that day because for the Jew, there was no separation of church and state. The temple was the center of your government and of your religion. So religious parties were very important. Which one did you belong to? And to know which one someone belonged to is very helpful to understand why they're saying what they're saying. So the Pharisees, they were a group of individuals who were trying to rectify the problem. All the prophets had said the Messiah would have come by now. At this period in the first century, Daniel was very clear on it. Where was he? And so a religious group arose that was trying to solve the problem. They knew from the book of Deuteronomy and from all the the prophets that the reason why they had lost their king, their Messiah, and gone into exile was because of sin. Well, if the Messiah is delayed and they're still under foreign governance, the problem must be sin. And it was. So the Pharisees decided to wipe out sin from the land. That was their hope. If we can wipe out sin, if we can have one day, one moment, when no one commits sin in the Holy Land, the Messiah will appear. Pretty good plan, right? Then all of a sudden it would come back. Well, they were right. There was an intimate connection between the coming of the Messiah and sin, but it wasn't going to be solved by trying to follow the law of Moses perfectly. Right? So, carrying your pal on the Sabbath, that's not against the law. That's not against the law of the Sabbath in, in Exodus. But they put hedges around the law. You cannot carry your pal on the Sabbath because what if that might be considered labor? Work on the Sabbath. And then we're all going to be in exile that much longer, at least political exile. So, hedges around the laws. So the Pharisees, we get this idea of them in the New Testament as some sort of hypocrites, but they're not. They're the ones that were following Jesus everywhere. They wanted to know the law as best as they could. And here's this new rabbi, very influential. They listened to him. No, wait a minute. That's not what Moses said. You have heard that it was said of old to the men of old. Listen to this. But I say to you, well, this guy's trouble. You gotta get rid of him. Right? They don't want to get rid of him at that stage, at least early on, because they're hypocrites and they see him as a really nice guy and they don't like nice guys. But they see him as very dangerous for what 
what their plan of action was. Their plan was to get Sin away from the land. This guy, very influential, charismatic teacher, telling people not to apply to the law of Moses. At least their understanding of it. So his trade, Paul was a pit maker. Not for Coleman, but a tent maker, very common. This is a very common way of living in, the, uh, in that region of Palestine. Not everyone was wealthy enough to have houses, especially if you were traveling. Tents, very useful. The ancient RV. <laughs> Conversion to Christianity. Paul was converting the miraculous event on the road to Damascus and baptized by Ananias, after which he spent three years praying and meditating in the Arabian desert. Where am I getting all this information? The Bible. Right? Not from his epistles, though. There's little bits of it, biographical or autobiographical of his epistles. But the vast majority of the life of Paul and his travels come out of what the book we call Acts of the Apostles, a book that most people never read. Right? Acts of the Apostles, right? Nobody talks about so. It's one of those important books in the New Testament. First missionary journey. So we talked about the man who was the basic information about him, but then what did he do? Why are we talking about him 2,000 years later? Well, it's not because he lived in Tarsus or moved to Jerusalem or stood there at the stoning of the death of Stephen. There were a lot of other Pharisees around doing that. But it's because of what he did next. After his conversion, he began a series of missionary journeys. And on those missionary journeys, he became Paul the apostle to the Gentiles because of the mass conversions of Gentiles from his preaching in the Gentile regions of Greece and Asia Minor. So, the first missionary journey, Acts 13. Notice I'm giving you references to Acts of the Apostles all along the way. I hope that part of your reading of the Pauline Epistles, you read Acts of the Apostles. In fact, if you want to read the Acts of the Apostles and understand it, you, I mean, the Pauline Epistles this year, you need to know Acts of the Apostles like the back of your hand. In his first missionary journey, Paul, accompanied by Barnabas and John Mark, I'm putting them in bold there because these are key names and key cities uh, within the uh, Pauline theology was sent by the Holy Spirit from the church at Antioch. From the port of Seleucia, they traveled to Cyprus, Perga, Pamphylia, the city of Antioch. That's the other Antioch, that's the city. And the three cities of Lyconia, or Lyconia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, on his trip back into Palestine, Paul encountered Judean Christians in Antioch. So if you look on your map, um, you can, the cream one now, probably be easier for you. What they, what, did, what did they begin to call this? Uh, the believer Christian. Excuse me? What did, what did they call the believer Christian? Uh -huh. I'm going to deal with that in one second. Okay. It has to do with the food festival. All right. Now, the first journey. Okay. The first journey. All goes back to the food festival. You see the first journey on the cream piece of paper there? Yeah. Paul was in Antioch. <laughs> Where we're told in Acts of the Apostles, the followers were first called Christians. Little Christ, anointed ones. So Antioch, you see there on the map. So if you look, find, your, find Jerusalem down there on the, on, in the uh, same first journey mound there. So you can get your bearings. Go north, up the coast, through Syria, and you get to Antioch of Syria. Antioch was a major center of Christianity, second only to Jerusalem in the early church. And after Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, Antioch became the center of Christianity for the region. And also for the next century. Uh, so Antioch, Paul leaves Antioch, goes to Cyprus for a little vacation on the island, and then he goes up, what's the vacation? He goes up into Asia Minor, traveling through those cities that are listed there. That's all this information comes out of Acts the Apostles that Luke gives us. And then when he gets all the way to, uh, to the, he gets to the city of, uh, the cities of Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, and he turns around and retraces his steps. Comes back to the coast, gets on a boat, and goes straight to Antioch. That's his first journey. On that first journey, Paul did not write any, any epistles. He's just out there preaching. <clears throat> now, uh, on page two of the notes there. So second, we're going to look at those, those references and acts in a second. We're just looking at a summary for right now. 
second missionary journey after having delivered the letters written from the apostles in Jerusalem. So Paul gets back to Antioch after preaching and converting mass numbers of Gentiles. He had the same plan in each city. You can see it in Acts of the Apostles. He waits till the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, he goes to the local synagogue. Why? Because he was a seven-day Adventist. <laughs> because this is when the Jews are in the synagogue. It's on the Sabbath. You don't go to the synagogue. You like come to the church. You want to, if you want to come and talk to a bunch of Catholics, right? Well, you might come to the morning liturgy or the morning mass or something. But you're not going to get the parish, right? If you want to talk to a bunch of Catholics of St. John, the vast majority of the parish, what day would you go? <laughs> Why? Because that's the day you're here, right? So the, the, Paul goes into the synagogues on the Sabbath and Acts of the Apostles because that's the day when the Jews are in highest concentration in the synagogue. Why do I tell you that? Because you may know some Sunday Adventists who will sometimes pull a wool over your eyes by saying, look, see, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Look, well, every time he goes to the synagogue, it's on the Sabbath. When else would you go to talk to the Jews? So he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath in each city. He stands up and he begins to preach Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. Did some Jews listen? Yeah, Daniel said he was coming. Gosh, Paul's making a lot of sense there. Yeah, but this Jesus was, they all knew, they'd heard about this Jesus. Yeah, that guy was crucified. I know, that's what the prophet said was going to happen. That's what the Psalms say. That's what it all says. Oh gosh, he's right. So many would begin to follow him and listen to him. Sometimes he'd be invited back the next Sabbath to preach in the synagogue. But eventually tension would start to rise. Someone would say, no, this can't be the Christ. He can't be the Christ. There's no way. This guy's preaching heresy. And so a division would happen in the synagogue. Usually the vast majority would reject Christ as the Messiah. But a small contingent would go with Paul. Paul would be kicked out of the synagogue. Sometimes they'd throw rocks at him on the way. right? And then Paul would leave and he'd say, enough. I'm going to the Gentiles. And he'd shake the dust from his feet, right? But it doesn't mean that he's given up on the Jews. But rather, in that city, he's done preaching to the Jews. He's done what he could. He now goes in the marketplaces, into the amphitheater, into all of the places where the Greeks would be, or the non-Jews, Greek being mean, mean in that context, Gentiles. And then, after he was done there, he would go on to the next city. Wait till the Sabbath? Go in the synagogue. Same plan of action, all the way through Acts of the Apostles like that. So, in his second missionary journey, after having delivered the letter written from the Apostles in Jerusalem at the church at Antioch, along with Barnabas, we'll look at that, the issue with Antioch in a second, he went on his second missionary journey. Now, if you look at the map there, you can see he travels in the second missionary journey from Antioch up uh, to... We're missing a little bit of narrative there on the map. He went. He came back to Antioch on the first journey, and then had to go down to Jerusalem for the uh, council in Jerusalem. Then he went back up to Antioch and took off from there for his next missionary journey. Antioch was a staging ground for his his trips. What was the controversy that he was trying to resolve? I don't this issue. No, we're going to look at this. Okay, so Antioch, from Antioch by foot, he goes up, decides to preach in the, to the same areas he preached before, Galatia and that region, and Pisidia. And then he decides to go further, and he goes across up to Troas, and then over to Macedonia. <clears throat> Paul took Silas with him, began his second trip through Syria and Cilicia. Paul traveled to Lyconia, was joined by, in Lystra by Timothy. He traveled through Phrygia, Galatia, and Lystra, Troas, being joined by Luke. He then went into Macedonia, where he founded churches in Philippi. So you look on the map there, he's over, he crosses from Troas, across the strait, over to Philippi, then to Thessalonica, and then to the Bereans. Oh, the Bereans. Right? You've got them here in the region, right? The Baptist Church of Berea. Right? No. That's a very common title for Protestant churches. Why? Because in Berea, when Paul began to preach, the Jews said, no, wait a minute. This is interesting, but we're going to check. We look in the Old Testament with Isaiah. Paul oh, didn't have a title like that. But they checked the scriptures, and they searched. They found what Paul said is actually correct. And they believed in Christ. So for the Berean Jews are oftentimes used as a symbol of those who search the scriptures to see if that Pope in Rome was really right. 
So, the Berean, Baptist Church of Berea, the Berean this, the Berean that. So, he goes to Berea, then from Berea down to Athens, and then into Corinth. And from Corinth, when he's in Corinth, Athens and Corinth, he gets information from his disciples, Timothy and Silas, that he left up there. They come down, they say, Paul, you left Thessalonica too quick. Too quickly. You were up there preaching, and the Jews, the local Jews start throwing rocks at him. So he took off by night. He ended up down in, in, uh, in Achaia. And Timothy and Silas caught up and said, Paul, you got to take care of the problem up there. Thessalonica, they've got some questions about death and the second coming of Christ. I mean, you did some great preaching, some great conversions, but the church in Berea is in turmoil right now. So Paul wrote his first two letters of the New Testament canon. And that is 1st and then 2nd Thessalonians. He wrote one letter, handed it to Timothy. Timothy ran up to Thessalonica, handed it to them, delivered it, preached it. Wow, that's, that's some good information. Okay, that clears that question up. But what about... So Timothy ran back down to Achaia, went to Corinth, and Paul told Paul, hey, there's still some questions. All right. So he wrote another letter real quick. Handed it to Timothy, and Paul went up there and delivered or Timothy went up there and delivered that one. Now, can you imagine reading the, Thess- the, le- the epistle to the Thessalonians without knowing the biblical context? Furthermore, the, the epistles to the Thessalonians are towards the end of the Pauline corpus in your Bible that's sitting in front of you. But you would only read it to the end, at the end, having read through all this other stuff. You have to have the historical context to understand the letter. Third missionary journey. Paul began his trip by crossing Phrygia and Galatia, eventually traveling into Ephesus. So Paul goes back to Antioch, and he takes off again. He goes through the same region, and he goes to Ephesus. So if you look on your cream-colored map there, you can see a line that kind of doesn't stop at any city, but just stops at Ephesus. Do you see that? That's because Acts the Apostles doesn't tell you what cities he stopped in along the way. It just said he traveled through the region of Galatia and went to Ephesus. So you would expect he probably hit the same cities, the same regions, same churches, same groups of people along the way. Uh, but we're not told about Acts the Apostles, so we don't know. Do you see how important Acts the Apostles is for determining this information about Paul? So he goes to Ephesus, and when he's in Ephesus, some Christians arrive from Corinth. Corinth, that he evangelized the previous journey, was in a total disaster. There was infighting. Some Christians had arrived from Jerusalem, or at least said they had come from Jerusalem and had been given the mission to come by the apostles in Jerusalem. And so they're preaching something very different from what Paul was preaching when he got there. And some Christians in Corinth, who are friends with Paul, who are aligned with Paul, write a letter, and they go and deliver it to Paul. Where they write the letter, they send some people, and they deliver it to Paul in Ephesus. They hear Paul's up in Ephesus, and they bring it, and they say, Paul, here's what's going on in Corinth, and here's the letter from those who are aligned with you. Paul reads the letter. Wow. So he writes the letter real fast, throws it in their hand, and they take it back to Corinth. That's 1 Corinthians. And while he's in Corinth, or in Ephesus, he's pondering some of the stuff he saw in Galatia as he was traveling through. Something's eating at him when he saw. And so he decided to write a letter back to the Christians of Galatia, that region. And so on Ephesus, he wrote a letter to the Corinthians because of a letter he received from the Corinthian church. And then he also wrote a letter back to Galatia to be passed from church to church throughout the whole region, dealing with something that he saw as a systemic problem throughout all of Galatia. We'll look at that. Then eventually Paul left Ephesus, traveled up into Macedonia, probably somewhere in Philippi, in the region of Macedonia, we know from his second letter. He had to write another letter down to the Corinthians. He's up in Macedonia. If you look on your map there, you see he's up in the region of Philippi again. Probably in the city of Philippi, but Acts doesn't tell us specifically there. And he receives information while he's in Macedonia that there's still more problems in Corinth. So before he gets there, he wants to send a letter to prepare them. 
So 2 Corinthians, he tells him he's really mad by the time you get to 2 Corinthians, this is Paul's personality just comes out. <laughs> he's all over the place. This looks like a modern email. There's no structure or anything. He's just <laughs> mad. And he's paragraph after paragraph, topic after topic, interwoven as his mind is racing about all the stuff that he's hearing about. And he tells him, when I get there, you better be careful because I'm bringing a whip. He's mad. So he gets there, and fortunately, things have settled down before he gets there. That second letter really quieted things down in Corinth. So when Paul arrived, people were ready. They're waiting. Okay, he's here. And Paul then began to fix the problems in Corinth and remained there a while, preaching. And while he was there, he wrote a letter up to the church in Rome that he had heard a lot about. He had never been there. But there were Christians already forming in the church in Rome. How'd they get there? We don't know. We do know that there were Jews in Jerusalem during Pentecost who accepted the Christ and had then traveled probably back up to Rome. So those, that's probably the earliest stage of the formation of that church. But there was also lots of traveling before between Asia Minor and the Christians there and probably the, the Jews in Rome. And so you would have had some influence. So somehow a Christian community began to develop in Rome. Not initiated by Peter, nor by Paul. So Paul writes this letter up to the to the church in Rome, who he's heard a lot of really good stuff about, but also some problems. Some of the same problems he had seen back in Galatia. And so he wrote a letter while he was in Corinth up to the church in Rome. Very different tone. He's never met these Christians. Maybe one or two of them through the trade routes, as he mentions at the end of the letter. But he has never been to that church. So he handles them very differently, praises them. Worse than the first chapter, you guys are great. I've heard lots of good stuff about you. I hope you get up there someday. But then he begins to deal with something he had heard about going on in the church in Rome, the same problem as he had seen in Galatia. Now again, not knowing the historical context, that there's a relationship between what he saw in Galatia and what he had heard about in the church in Rome, and the fact that he'd never been in Rome, that he'd been in Galatia. That's all essential if you're going to read Romans and Galatians. Right? And to know that he's in Corinth while he's writing the letter. Because what's going on in Corinth is forming what he's dealing with and saying to the, in his letter up to the up to the Romans. So that after leaving Corinth, uh, he eventually traveled back to the region of Palestine, and you got the section on page three at the top, voyage to Rome. Leaving Corinth, Paul made his way back to Jerusalem where he was soon in prison and brought to Caesarea. After two years of interrogations, Paul appealed to Caesar's judgment and was sent to Rome. Acts the Apostles' narrative closes with his arrival in Rome and the setting in prison there and what was going on. After that, we don't have a lot of biographical information about Paul. We know that he went back to Palestine. He was imprisoned for preaching. The Jews got it, started a, a, a uh, tumult, and Paul was thrown into prison. The Romans in the region didn't know what to do with him. It was some sort of religious debate. I don't know. Throw him in prison until things calm down. And then eventually, Paul appealed to Caesar in one of the inter interrogations in front of the Romans. They said, well, it's appealed to Caesar. Law is. He's got to go to Caesar now. I don't know what Caesar's going to do with this guy. It's just a little, you know, head of the Jews. So he went up to Rome. And Acts the Apostles closes with his arrival in Rome and the setting and, and actually the amount of freedom he had there. Why? Because he was a Roman citizen. Roman citizen. Remember, he was from Tarsus. And Tarsus, along with a number of other cities, had been given the permission to use Roman citizenship. You were born in Tarsus or another city. Certain cities, very important in the Greco Roman Empire, had been given the gift that those citizens had the same rights of a citizen of Rome. Very important in the Roman Empire. So Paul goes to Rome and he begins to preach and deal with the Christians there in Rome. And while he's in prison, he writes what we call the captivity letters. So if you look there on the, the uh, section there, Voyage to Rome, and then First Roman Captivity. During his first captivity in Rome, Paul wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Commonly called the captivity letters. He's in prison while he's writing them. If you don't know he's in prison while he's writing these epistles, and he's writing them all around the same time, you won't understand those epistles. What's going on? He's talking about suffering. He's in prison for Christ. 
And it's in these epistles that we get Paul's most thorough development of his understanding of suffering as part of the salvation of the Christian. Uniting your suffering with Christ. Christ suffered unjustly, and so he suffered unjustly in prison, and he begins to preach about this, starts to purvey those letters. And Christians in general also started to be persecuted, so it starts to, it's, it's relevant. Final trip in captivity appears that after Paul was in prison in Rome, he somehow managed to get himself released. We're not told. We don't know. Why? Because Acts of the Apostles is done. The book from which we were getting all of our biographical information about Paul and his travels ended. Luke finished with his arrival in Rome, that was it. So from here, it gets the only information we can gather is from the early tradition of the church and from the other epistles that he wrote. Little bits of autobiographical information he gives. So from there, he's released. Once he gets to Rome, probably preached to Caesar. We don't know. And Caesar said, whatever, get out of here. So nothing to do with us. So Paul's released somehow. And then uh, he made one last trip down into Macedonia where he wrote his first letter to Timothy. Again, we don't know anything about this trip. What happened? All we know is that he was in Macedonia when he wrote a letter to Timothy, his disciple, who was in Ephesus. So Timothy's down in Ephesus. Paul appointed him as the bishop of that city. Very important city. Next to Antioch, Ephesus is the next most important city in the early church there. He's the bishop of that city. And, again, if you don't know the problems of the period in Ephesus and what's going on in Ephesus, you won't know why Paul said the things he said to Timothy there. He also left Titus down in Crete, a little island just off the coast there, down in Crete as the bishop in that city, on that island. And he wrote a letter to Titus. Titus and 1 Timothy are very similar. These are called the pastoral epistles. Paul is the disciple, or is the, the master uh, of Timothy and Titus. They are his disciples. And so Paul speaks to them like a religious superior, a, spirit, a spiritual father. In fact, he refers to them as his children, his sons, and he's their father. And he speaks to them that way, like you'd expect a bishop to speak to the local pastor. Something like that. And so Paul speaks to the local bishops that he's appointed, Timothy and Titus, who are also his friends, his good friends, and journey with him. And he tells them some good pastoral advice. If a man presents himself uh, to be ordained to the diaconate, make sure he's not a drunkard. And make sure uh, these other things. And by the way, when people come to you and they have a dispute over the law and this and that, think about it very carefully before you answer so he gives them pastoral advice. These are the epistles that I recommend at the seminary oftentimes for the seminarians to read before they go into a parish. Meditate on these epistles because they're very pastoral. They have very practical advice, even relevant today. With fact, mission to email. So, uh, <laughs> martyred for the faith in Rome. According to Eusebius, Paul, along with Peter, was martyred in Rome during Nero's persecution. According to tradition, Paul was buried on Via Ostensis, not far from the northern side of Sao Paulo. So the, the uh, Paul, again, we don't have a lot of information, just from the little bits we can get from tradition and from those last epistles, Paul eventually goes back to Rome somehow. Whether he was in prison in Macedonia and brought in chains to Rome, we don't know, or he went back to Rome and was thrown in prison. Somehow Paul ended up again in prison in Rome after writing 1 Timothy and Titus, and then he wrote what is oftentimes understood to be his last epistle, 2 Timothy. He writes one last epistle down in Ephesus uh, to Timothy down in Ephesus. And it's in this letter that you start to hear Paul speaking about the, more about the imprisonment and suffering, some more pastoral advice to Timothy, but very uh, uh, pastoral advice so you can hear this. He knows this is going to be the last words he has with Timothy. He speaks in chapter 4 as if he's never going to see Timothy again. So, after that, shortly, as far as we can gather from tradition and as far as we can gather from that epistle, Paul was martyred uh, in the 60s along with Peter in Rome, in prison, on Peter, and they were martyred sometime uh, during the persecution of Nero. Okay, any questions behind that? Yeah. Yes. Um, where, which number, where is left? 
letter to the Hebrews. It must be the Old Testament, right? No. So then, where does that fit in? The Hebrews, right? The 14 epistles of Paul. So Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, if you look in your Bible, in fact, it's a good question, look in your Bible at the epistles of Paul. Where is the epistle to the Hebrews? At the end. At the end. Well, that should be peculiar to you because Paul's epistles are listed in order of length. In your, in your, which is many groupings of the, Bible, of the books of the Bible. Remember, the Bible is a liturgical book. It was designed to be used in, in church, not to be grabbed off Walmart shelf and read or pulled out of a drawer at the, at, um, at the local hotel. Yeah, along with now Book of Mormon. So uh, it wasn't designed that way. This is a liturgical text, and it was used for the epistle, read the lectionary, read the gospel, read in the early church. So. Uh, the arrangement is not necessarily the way you would think, as a historical novel or something. So his epistles are listed for, in order of length, longest to shortest, and also community. Then you come to his particular epistles to individuals, and you come to Timothy, first, uh, second Timothy, Titus, short, and then Philemon. Right? Nothing to historical order. And then all of a sudden you get to the Hebrews, this huge epistle, as long as the epistle to the Romans. Why is it there? Because it wasn't clear whether Paul had wrote this in the early church. Many church fathers debated about the issue. There's nowhere in the text that it says, I, Paul, am writing this by my own hand, all that stuff that's clear. The other epistles is clear Paul wrote them. He says, I, Paul, did this. I, Paul, write this to you by my own hand. The epistle of Hebrews, there's no name about the author. So many have wondered and debated even as early as Jerome and Augustine who questioned whether or not Paul had wrote that. St. John Chrysostom, most of the Greek fathers in the East always said he, it was written by Paul in the West. By the time Jerome, they're questioning, debating about it. But eventually, Jerome himself and most of the Western father eventually aligned with what was the, the tradition in the East. That was that Paul had definitely written this. So, on the new, so by the time you get into the epistles, or into your Bible, where is it going to be? Let me throw it at the end. You know, I'm not really sure. It's most likely Pauline. But... All right. Uh, the very important epistle, though. Read it for your reading cycle this year. Okay, let's take a break, five minute break, and we'll begin the next section. Make sure you stand up. You have to stand up and breathe. <laughs>
talking, so take one of these, Spirit Crusades. That's, that's the upcoming, that's the next series, so I should have had that for you already. Right? No. 
he, the husband or the wife knows all the historical context. And so just say, and Johnny did this, and uh, you know, Lucy, she she was off doing this and whatever. The terms and 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 uh, experiences from your life would be used so quickly you wouldn't be able to follow or someone 2,000 years from now, not knowing you, the historical setting. Okay. So to read Paul's epistles by opening your Bible from the shelf in Walmart or from the drawer in the hotel is the same thing. And so when you come to Romans 3.28, behold, and man is justified by faith apart from the works of law. And you sit there and say, okay, I know what faith is and I know what works are. No, you don't. You're, you're using the way that those terms are used in your own modern experience and applying it to Paul and his period. Imagine someone reading what you said in one of your letters and doing that. They misunderstand much of it. And so that often it happens. Paul's epistles are so confusing, especially in our modern day, because people don't know the historical setting. So, Acts the Apostles. You've got to know the story to understand that story that we summarized and I gave to you in the last section that we talked about, Paul's mission and his conversion and his life, all that stuff. That's Acts the Apostles. In a summary, in a nutshell, you must read through Acts the Apostles. In fact, I recommend reading it at least three times before you start reading his epistles. And when you read his epistles, you have to read them in historical order and place... So when you're reading Acts the Apostles and Paul goes through Thessalonica on his second journey and he comes down to Corinth and you know now that he wrote his two epistles back to the Thessalonians at that moment, that's when you want to break out the first and second Thessalonians and read them. And then when on his third journey Paul arrives, goes through Galatians, he gets to Ephesus. That's when you want to read 1 Corinthians at the moment when he wrote it and Galatians. And when he then travels into Philippi, Macedonia, that's when you want to read 2 Corinthians. And when he gets down to Corinth, that's when you want to read the Epistle to the Romans. But I don't recommend doing that yet until you've really gone over the story of Acts and you're really comfortable with it. So, read Acts through at least once completely, just as one story. Then go back the second time, or maybe even the third time, Make sure you don't know too many times. You want to make sure you get through Paul's epistles. And then read his epistles. But read them in the historical order that they were written and in the location where he wrote them. Okay? And you have that information you need in that first section of those I gave you. Okay? You'll be able to do that. So Acts, the Acts, the key to Paul's epistles. Let's look at a section of Acts that will help give you a foundation at the beginning in this trying to decipher some of the more complex issues in Paul's epistles. Acts, a fantastic work, very complex literary work, but one that you can handle, deal with, not designed to start in chapter 10 as we're going to do, so a few words of background. Acts the Apostles, written by Luke, who was a companion of Paul on his travels, wrote this narrative to tell you the story of the early church. And, obviously, the most important figures in the church, Peter and Paul, are the major characters. In chapter 1, verse 8, Luke had said, recorded for us the words of Jesus to the disciples, the witnesses in Jerusalem, that they would be his witnesses, not Jehovah's witnesses, but witnesses to the resurrection. First in Jerusalem, then out into Judea, the outlying region, then into Samaria, and then, and only then, to the ends of the earth. Right? There's an order of operations. First to the Jews in Jerusalem, then to the outlying region of Judea, then to the Samaritans, and then only they go to the Gentiles. So, Acts the Apostles has been recording that development of the preaching in Jerusalem first at Pentecost, then to the outlying region of Judea, then uh, down into Samaria, or up into Samaria, and then... When you get to chapter 10 in Acts, the narrative is now beginning to tell you about the story of to the ends of the earth, that is, now to the Gentiles. So chapter 10. Paul's already converted. Back in chapter 9, we saw his conversion happen. No worse involved, remember? 
So he, fall, he falls down to the ground. He's taken to Damascus. He's baptized by Ananias. He goes off to Damascus. Uh, not Damascus, sorry. Out to the Arabian Desert for three years on retreat. And then he begins to preach against his, his missionary church. But to get the historical context of what's going on about Paul and what he's going to be dealing with, look at chapter 10, where we begin the preaching to the ends of the earth, that is, to the Gentiles. Up to this point, the church is thoroughly Jewish and Samaritan. Semitic. The whole idea that Jesus came and preached to the Jews, and they said, they rejected, you know, rejected him, crucified him, his blood upon us and our children, and then, wow, well, then all of a sudden the Gentiles came on the scene, here we are today. Not what happened. The church was thoroughly Jewish. Jesus was a Jew. His mother was a Jew. Contrary to some of the statues you'll see. And all the disciples were Jews. <coughs> the early church, the first 3,000 converts in Jerusalem were all Jews. By the time you get to chapter 10 of Acts, the church is a, a very influential sect among the Jews. Massive numbers of converts. <coughs> Pharisees have all come, many of them have converted. Many of the priests in the temple have become Christians at this stage. They're still going to the synagogue, still at the temple. Things aren't clear exactly how it's all going to work out. And then the question of the Gentiles arises in chapter 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. Now, Caesarea, this is not Caesarea Philippi, Matthew 16. This is Caesarea. City of Caesar of Caesar. There's many cities were named Caesarea this, Caesarea that, Caesar this, Caesar that. So Caesarea Maritime. This is Caesarea on the coast. You can see it on, on your map. It shows up and Paul is there on a number of occasions. You go down to your map on the bottom right hand corner of your map, which is Jerusalem, and then over on the coast, Joppa and Caesarea. The Romans were using Caesarea that is the coastal Caesarea, as their administrative center for the empire, uh, for that region. Okay? Not Jerusalem. They didn't care about Jerusalem. They wanted a seaport. And so the Roman Empire's administrative governmental center for the region of Judea was Caesarea on the coast. Okay? So Luke tells you, there's a man named Cornelius, which is Latin, not Greek, it's not Jewish. It's not even Greek. It's Latin. Cornelius. U.S. Paul, Luke is giving you these details. He didn't have to tell you his name. He didn't have to tell you what city it was in. Luke is telling you these details, though, for a very important reason. He's trying to show you what's about to take place in the narrative. A man named Cornelius who was in Caesarea. Rome. Rome. Of the Italian cohort. Italian cohort? Why does he tell you that? Because Italians like to eat cheese with their pepperoni. <laughs> no. Why does he tell you that? Well, because he's of the Italian cohort. The Romans oftentimes hired local peoples to come into their army and even become centurions. This Cornelius does not want to have. He's not a Syrian. He's not any of those guys. He's a Latin of the Latins. This guy's an Italian. Right? His name is Cornelius. I'm serious. This is what Luke is trying to show you. And he's in the very center of the Roman administrative center. When you say Caesarea, for a Jew in Jerusalem, <laughs> Cornelius. Right? A Latin language. And worse, he's one of them. Right? Okay. So Luke's giving you a really key individual to really set the stage here. And but he was a devout man who feared God with all of his household. Back then, religion wasn't a personal me and Jesus thing. It was a whole family of them. Okay. So he and his whole household were God fears. This is a technical term in the Old and New Testament for an individual who was not of the descent of Abraham, but thought the God of Abraham was the true God of, his, uh, of the world, the universe. So he's a God fear. Job, other individuals in the Old Testament are given this title, God fear. So he was a God fear. He worshipped the God of Israel. He even might go to the synagogue occasionally, sit in the back, you know. But he 
probably wasn't circumcised, probably wasn't, this guy definitely not, but wasn't, the, most of them wouldn't get circumcised, kosher loss, you know, they still like their bacon in the morning, that kind of stuff, okay? And especially this guy, pepperoni with the cheese, right? The meat and the dairy on the same plate? I don't know. Okay, so, but he feared God with all of his household, his kids, his wife, his friends, the whole group, they had, were worshiping the God of Israel. And they gave alms liberally to the people. Mm. So the people liked them. So they also donated to the local synagogue, too. And they prayed constantly to God. And about the ninth hour of the day, ninth hour, that's 3 p.m. in the afternoon, 3 p.m., ninth hour of the day, so he's praying. He's praying the hours of prayer. Jews prayed every three hours. So the Muslims got the idea. So the, they prayed every three hours. Right? They started with the first hour, that is sunrise, which we call 6 a.m. So the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming and saying, to Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror. Remember, angels in the Bible and in reality are not decapitated fat babies with wings. Okay? <laughs> angels are scary. They kill people when they show up on the scene. Right? So, <laughs> angels wiped out entire nations in the Old Testament from the people of Israel. They're not to be messed with. So when an angel appears, <laughs> people are afraid in the Bible. They don't, oh, give them an angel. Okay, so, so then... He was afraid. He was in terror. I must have said something wrong in my prayer. I'm dead, man. What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodged with Simon and Tanner, who is in the house on the seaside. You can see Caesarea and Joppa. They're right next to each other on the coast. Verse 9. The next day, as they were on their journey and coming near the city... Peter was up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. What's the sixth hour? Noon. It's coming up. Noon. What do you do at noon? Eat. Eat, Eat your lunch, right? Okay, so he's up. It's lunchtime. He's up on the rooftop. This isn't a rooftop like at your home today. But the rooftops of the house were flat. And you'd go up there. You'd, you'd, they often had dry food up there. People would sleep up there during the summer when it was hot. And, uh, in fact, you know probably a number of biblical stories where they're up on the rooftop doing something. So he's up on the rooftop. It's quiet up there. He's praying. And what's going on down below? They're making lunch, right? Okay, so he's up. He's trying to pray. His stomach's growling. He hasn't anything since morning, he hasn't anything since breakfast. Lunchtime is approaching. He's up there trying to pray, concentrate, and this is what happens. And he became hungry and desired something to eat. But while they were preparing, and he fell into a trance and saw the heaven open and something descending like a tablecloth. Right? A great sheet coming down. In the ancient world, you know, you know, a big table like we do, but in the palace, you lay a cloth out on the ground. That's right? because dirt or stone or something. You lay a cloth out and you put the food out there. The men all lay there and they eat. Right? They lay on their left elbow and they sit there and they eat. And they talk. Right? So he sees the cloth coming down. He smells the food coming coming up, right? From the from the underneath him, and the cloth is coming down to be eaten. Food finally. And what happens? And in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. Reptiles. Leviticus chapter 11 gives you the kosher laws. You could not eat a single reptile. Not a single one of them was clean. Okay, so reptiles, lizards, and snakes are the symbol of uncleanness. But many of the birds in the air as well were unclean. So he sees all kinds of animals. Reptiles and birds of the air, and there came a voice. Rise, Peter, eat and kill. This is probably as the lady down the, down the bottom is saying, Peter, I'm eating. He's having this vision, right? Rise, Peter, eat, kill and eat. But Peter said, No, for I have never eaten anything that is unclean or common. And the voice came to him again a second time. When God is cleansed, you must not call common. This happened three times. And the thing was taken up once again. Why three times? Because Jesus rose on the third day, right? No, Jesus rose on the third day because in the Bible the symbol of the tree is complete or perfection. He was completely dead. 
If he had risen on the second day, people would wonder, hmm, maybe he was just unconscious. But it's for, the number three is complete or perfection in the Bible. You can see it throughout the Old New Testament, the use of it that way. So Peter knows this wasn't just a daydream. It happened three times. For a Jew, that means absolutely this was real. So then, now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men that there came from Cornelius, having been in query for Simon's house, stood before the gate, called out to ask where Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging. While Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit sent him, this is verse 19, Behold, three men are looking for you. Verse 20. Rise, go down, and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them to you. Acts of the Apostles, along with John chapters 14 through 16, gives us our most thorough pneumatology or study about the Spirit in the early church. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright man. Cornelius, the centurion, but he's an upright man. He's a God-fearer, okay? Who is well spoken by the whole Jewish nation. <laughs> was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to this house and to hear what you have to say. So he called them in to be his guest. Next day he rose and went off with them and came to the brethren with, from Joppa and the company who had accompanied him. Verse 24, and on the following day they entered Caesarea. So he goes from Joppa, this little Jewish village on the coast, with the other Jewish Christians and they come with Cornelius' friends who had been sent and they come to Caesarea. And they come to Caesarea, the center of the Gentiles among them. And Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his kinsmen and his close friends. So it's not just Cornelius, his wife, his dad, some kids running around, a couple servants. All of his relatives, who are all Italians. <laughs> And he smells Gentile food cooking <laughs> in the house. And all his friends are there. In Corn uh, let's see. Verse 25, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted, up, lifted him up, saying, stand up, who's the man? And as he talked with worship there, uh, it means he honored him, gave him obeisance. He bowed down to him. He said, don't worry, just stand up. Thank you. But Peter lifted him up, saying, stand up, for I am two men. And he talked with him, and he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, imagine this, he walks into a dark room. You know, the door opens, Cornelius meets the door. Come on in, come on in. Okay. He comes in, and he's in a room about this big, surrounded by Gentiles. Stinking, uncircumcised Gentiles who eat stuff that is unclean. Peter has now entered into the occasion of sin, right? He's amidst total uncleanness. He looks around. He lifted up, uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 28, and he found that. Verse 27. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered together. Verse 28. And he said to him, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with any or to visit anyone of another nation. Notice, he doesn't say a Christian. And he still understands himself as a Jew. Which he is. Oh. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call common or unclean any man. So he understood what the dream was about. So when I sent for, when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked him, why have you sent for me? So he knows that this is of God, but he's still frustrated about the whole thing. And it stinks, right? <laughs> and Cornelius said, four days ago, about the, this hour, I was keeping the ninth hour of prayer in my house, so they were making dinner. Behold, a man stood before me in bright apparel, saying, Cornelius, your prayer is an answer. Send for Simon. So I sent for you. Mm -hmm. Verse 34. And Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, in every nation, Anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable him. You know the word which he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace by Jesus Christ. He, the Lord, he is the Lord of all. And he begins to preach the basic story of Jesus, the gospel message. And he says, 
talks about how he was crucified when he was in Jerusalem. In verse 20, but God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day. Not to all, but to his witnesses. And we ate and drank with him. Verse 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one ordained by God to be judged of the living and of the dead. That's the gospel message right there. In a nutshell. Verse 43, to him all the prophets bear witness that everyone Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. It's a basic theme of Acts of the Apostles. Well, Peter was still saying this. So at the moment he's saying that, and this is not only open to the Jews, but he's the Messiah of all the world. As he's saying this to everyone, verse 44, while Peter was still saying this, the Holy Spirit fell on all of them even on the Gentiles, who heard the word and the believers from among the circumcised. Remember, there's a couple of guys standing at the door still with Peter looking in, wondering what's going on in there. Who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had poured out even on Gentiles. Disgusting. <laughs> For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And Peter declared... Can anyone forbid water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they came, and they, then they uh, asked him to remain for some days. Yeah. What's the big deal? Well, it's massive. Peter's in big trouble now. Chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. So... Rumors started to spread about what Peter had done. He had baptized Gentiles. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him. Now what's the circumcision party? It's not fun to be circumcised. You don't throw a party, right? This is the sect of those who were advocating that we should never go to the Gentiles. This is something only for us. If, the, if any Gentiles want to come in, they're going to be circumcised, get kosher laws, all that. So up to this point, no Gentiles had come in. And those who were strongly advocating that, that they should not have anything to the Gentiles, they came to Peter when he got to Jerusalem. What were you doing down in Caesarea? He <laughs> heard rumors, Peter. So, saying, why did you go to the uncircumcised men and even worse, eat with them? You know what they eat? But Peter began to explain to them in order I was in the city of Joppa praying. I fell in a trance, and something like a sheep came down. All the animals were there, and God said, eat it. And it happened. Look at verse, uh, let's see, verse 7. And I heard the voice saying, Peter, rise, eat, and kill. I said, no way. I wouldn't do that. Verse 9, but the voice answered a second time, and it happened. Verse 10, this happens three times. And I said, oh. Alright. Well, it must not have been just a daydream about your hunger. And at the very moment three men arrived, verse 11, at the house in which we were in, and we went into Caesarea, and the Spirit told me to go in, and I preached the gospel to them. Verse 14. Uh, let's see. Uh, so he said, he relates the whole story. Verse 14, he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all of your household, not just those who are of the age of reason. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he did upon us, beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the, some, some gift, the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to, who, who could I... Who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard this, they were silenced. They glorified God, saying to the Gentiles, also God has granted repentance of life. You think, oh, of course. No. 2,000 years ago, this wasn't so clear. Now us, a bunch of stinky Gentiles, stand in the same room, sweating. We're, you know, this is, this is clear to us, but it wasn't so clear in the early church. Verse 19, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Right? We had a question about the first Christians. Here's what happens. But there were some of them, men at Cyprus and Cyrene, who coming to Antioch spoke to the Greeks, also preaching the Lord Jesus. 
and the hand of the Lord was with them, and many converted. So even Gentiles down in Antioch were showing her. So Cornelius and the Acts of the Apostles there is the beginning of the iceberg. Right? And so now all of a sudden they go to Antioch and they begin preaching in Antioch, even to the Gentiles, who are called Greeks here, excuse me, interchangeably, and mass conversions are happening now. And in verse 25, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. He knew Saul was a great orator and also knew the Gentile world and the Jewish world. He was a Pharisee, educated in Jerusalem and Gamaliel, but he also was raised in Tarsus. This is the guy we need for the job. So Barnabas goes up and he gets Saul from Tarsus. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a large company of people. And in Antioch, the disciples were for the first time called Christians. After the food festivals, I said. So in Antioch, the, the church, Holy Transfiguration, McLean, it comes from the root, the apostolic root of the Christians of Antioch. The patriarch of the Melchite Catholic Church is the bishop of Antioch. So from a juridical standpoint. So anyway, you'd asked about the early, the word Christian, where it comes from. This is the first use of the term, those who were first called Christians in Antioch. Verse 27. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Not, now on your map, you're thinking, down, wait a minute, they're going up. They're not dealing with a map in front of them, right? They're dealing with the landscape. And Jerusalem and Judea is up in the hills. Antioch's down lower. So in the Bible, whenever you go to Jerusalem, you always go up. Whenever you leave Jerusalem, you're always going down. Right? Not on your map, up and down. Okay. In verse 27, now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, Agabus, spoke of a great famine that was going to spread. And so Paul and Barnabas were told that they better send relief. So they start gathering stuff for the Christians of Judea. This is something that Paul does throughout all of his journeys. Constantly going and gathering goods for the Christians in Jerusalem and Judea, because those Christians in Jerusalem and Judea were living in common, waiting for the destruction of Jerusalem to happen. The real estate, belt, uh, the real estate market had dropped for the Christians. And the um, and also there was a family land which made, which made it worse. So Paul, all of his travels, you see through all of his epistles, constantly gathering stuff for the Christians in Jerusalem. Chapter 12 tells us about some more historical settings, stuff we don't have time to look at, but there we get the death of James the Greater, so second martyr of the church after Stephen. And then chapter 13, we pick up with the story of Paul again. In chapter 13, in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, a bunch of other guys. Verse 2, while they worshiped the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me for the work that I call them, Paul and Barnabas, or Saul and Barnabas. And they laid hands on them, and they set them off. And so Paul now begins what is called his first journey from Antioch. So if you look at your map, first journey there, here you're in the midst of the narrative of Acts of the Apostles, and you can see, you can follow along with the map where he's going to go next. He starts in Antioch, then he travels. So verse uh, 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. You look at your map, there it is, that's what happened. So we hear about Paul's travels through the region. And then verse 13. Now Paul, verse 13, chapter 13, verse 13. Now Paul and his company set sail from Paphos and came to Perak of Pamphylia. John left them. They went on. They traveled. And then uh, we see Paul coming to Pisidian Antioch, a different Antioch. that's in the Antioch of Pisidian. And you see his paradigm that he works with throughout all his travels. He goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath. The people look at him. I don't know, I've never seen that guy before. So then Paul's asked to speak. He presents the gospel of Christ to the Jews in the synagogue. Gets kicked out. And then he goes and preaches to the Gentiles. Then he continues on his travels. And you can see the tension between the Jews and the Gentiles throughout this narrative. In chapter 14, we hear about Paul's return then from this first journey. Chapter 14, verse 19. Chapter 14, verse 19. But Jews came there from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded people, they stoned Paul. So you can see Paul suffering even in his earliest journey. 
And he continues to travel and run from there. Verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying that, there, that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. So no health and wealth gospel, many hand for Paul, right? And when they had appointed elders, elders, presbyteroi, the word there is the Greek word from which we get our English word priest. In fact, in older translations, the word priest is put there. So they appointed priests or elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting. They committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, and they arrived in Antioch. So they've made their full circuit. Verse 26, they sailed to Antioch, and where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. So you have the first journey recorded there in Acts, right? Uh-oh, when he gets to Antioch, things aren't all that great. And when they arrived, they gathered the church together, declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they remained a little time with the disciples. Chapter 15. But... Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brethren, that is Christians, unless you are circumcised. Now the Christians in Antioch, for the most part, at this stage are probably a, a majority or a very large number of Gentiles. So the church in Jerusalem is almost all Jewish, right? The Jewish Christians come from Judea and they come to Antioch and they begin to preach that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved, you stinking Gentiles. And, Moses, and, and Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension to debate with them. And Paul and Barnabas were appointed with others to go up to Jerusalem, the apostles, the elders, about this question. Right? No, it's, it's a debate. Paul didn't simply say, no, I am an apostle. You're wrong. This is a hot debate. Paul said, wait a minute. This isn't what I was preaching. This isn't what was revealed to me by the Holy Spirit. These guys say they're from Jerusalem. So Paul and the others, are a group are sent, a representative group sent to Jerusalem where the rest of the apostles are to discern the matter. Verse 3, so being sent on their way to the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, reporting the conversion of the Gentiles. Verse 4, when they came to Jerusalem... They were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, or presbytery priests, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers, notice this, but some believers, that is some Christian Jews, who were of the party of the Pharisees, so they were hypocrites. No. You would expect, and it happened as you read through Acts of the Apostles, you see that massive number of conversions came primarily from the Pharisaical party. Because these were the guys who were masters of the law in the Old Testament. These were the who were ripe for conversion. They loved God and His commandments and the law. And so they were the ones that were most easily converted and accepting of the Messiah. Acts tells us even some of the priests, though, in the temple, who were often established, they even were converting as well. So when they became Christians, they didn't stop being Pharisees. They were still in the same religious mood. You can see how it's all mixed together at this stage. They rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to charge them to keep the law of Moses. Verse 6, chapter 15, verse 6. The apostles and the priests, or elders, were gathered together to consider this matter. To consider the matter. Notice, it's debatable at this stage. Verse 7, and after there had been much debate... Peter rose and said to the brethren, You know that in the early days God made choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Sorry, Cornelius, right? And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. Right? Peter had seen these Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit even without baptism, which was not normal. Supposed to be to receive the Holy Spirit, as Peter preached in chapter 2 of Acts, and then they, the baptism, then the Holy Spirit. But he saw Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit before baptism, so he knew, understood that he could baptize them, just as the apostles had received on Pentecost. So he says, Look, it happened to them just like us. Verse 9, and he made no distinction between us and them, but cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you make trial of God by putting a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we shall be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. 
So Jews and Gentiles will be saved in the same manner. Apart from circumcision and what they eat or don't eat, they eat lizards and things, it matters whether or not they have the faith in the covenant of Jesus in the New Testament. The way of Jesus as opposed to the way of Moses. Verse 12, And the assembly kept silence. They listened to Barnabas and Paul, who related all the great works from the Gentiles. You think, well, that's, that's good. They settled the matter. Not yet. Verse 13, After they finished speaking, James replied. Now, James is the very important leader in Jerusalem, especially when the rest of the apostles are gone. This is, some would suggest this is James the Lesser. That is one of the other Jameses among the twelve. It's possible. It might be also James who's called brother of the Lord or relative of Jesus in the New Testament. It's not really clear in the New Testament. But either way, there is a James who is bishop of Jerusalem, a very important leader of Jerusalem after the rest of the apostles leave that region. And so James is an influential individual in the church in Jerusalem. He stands up in the midst of the council and he says this, Brethren, listen to me. Simon has related how God first visited the Gentiles, and to take his name from among those people as well. And of course, the Old Testament says this. All the prophets proclaim this would happen. See, all nodding, yeah, yeah, yeah. And James, who's extremely practical, says this, verse 19, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. But we got to do something. we got to solve the problem. To simply just say this is not going to do anything. We have to have a practical way to resolve this. And so James says, We should write to them to abstain from the pollutions of idols, that is, to not eat food that had been sacrificed to an idol. And from porneia, that is, unlawful marriage, according to the law of Moses, that is, incestual marriages. And from what is strangled, that is, unproperly butchered meat. And from the eating and drinking of blood. Weird stuff to talk about the Gentiles, right? Well, in the in the ancient world, the Jew living in Antioch or in Rome or a major Greco-Roman city could not get food that had not been pro- meat that had not been properly butchered. In fact, it was very difficult to get wine or anything that had not been properly uh, that had not been already offered in a pagan temple. In the pagan world, you were a good Greek farmer or a rancher, and you brought your, your sheep and your wheat and whatever you had harvested. You'd bring it into Antioch or to Rome or the city. You'd bring it to the Temple of Venus or whatever your favorite god was. The priest would grab one of the lambs, grab a handful of wheat, throw, it, throw some of it to the fire of, to the, uh, on the altar of the god, take some of it for himself, and the rest, he'd say, okay, the rest is yours. Well, all of it had been offered to their god, and now they were being given back by Venus or Zeus what was left over. And then they went to the marketplace and sold it. Well, for a Jew, to eat that from the marketplace would be to be worshipping Zeus or Venus. So many of them were vegetarians, hence that last chapter of Romans. The weak man eats only vegetables. So then, James suggests something very practical. The Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians are not getting along. The Gentile Christians need to do something to resolve the matter. And James recommends the four rules from the Holiness Code of Leviticus. The Holiness Code of Leviticus, recorded in chapter 17 through 21, it's called the Holiness Code because it's there that God says, by doing this, you will be holy, as I, your God, am holy. The Holiness Code is not only for Jews but for Gentiles living among them in the Old Testament. And there's four things a Gentile has to do if he wants to live among the people of Israel and keep everything cool. He doesn't have to be circumcised. He doesn't have to be able to kosher He doesn't have to do any of those things. But he must not eat anything that's been sacrificed to an idol. He must not engage in marriages that are within the ancestral range or consanguinity against the law of Moses. He must not eat animals that have been improperly butchered. And he must not drink blood. So no robbers. These four things, if the Gentile in the Old Testament, if he kept those four rules, he could live in the Jewish village or among the camp of Israel while they're wandering through the wilderness those 40 years. And everything would be okay. He didn't have to be circumcised. Didn't have to keep the kosher laws or anything. 
What a genius idea. James has just taken the very center of the Pentateuch, the holiness code, which actually had regulations to resolve the conflict that was at issue in the early church. And he says, look, let's tell the Christians to do these things. At least, he says, as long as Moses is still being read in the synagogue. You think, wait a minute, I eat bratwurst. How come the church allows me to eat bratwurst now? Because Moses is not still being read in the synagogue that you attend. Right? In the early church, there was no clear distinction between the Christians and the synagogue, the Christian congregation and the synagogue on the Sabbath. Many of the Jews, the Jewish Christians, still on the Sabbath went to the synagogue. Then they gathered together the next day and talked about Jesus. So at this earliest stage of the church, James has got some practical ways to resolve this. And these four regulations are given. I've got that all laid out for you there in the notes. Do not eat meat offered to idols. Do not engage in unlawful marriage, pornea. The English translation sometimes have fornication or adultery or something like that. Bad translation in the context. You don't tell a Gentile Christian they can't commit fornication. They're, they can't engage in unlawful marriages that would upset their Jewish brother at the Lord's Supper the next day. So, Acts, uh, this is page 7 at the top, Acts 15 lists for the four prohibitions by which Gentile Christians were to abide in order to live in harmony with their Jewish Christian brethren, at least as long as those brethren continue to attend the local synagogue where Moses is still read, as James says. The list describes the four prohibitions of the Holiness Code of Leviticus, which were not only required for Israel, but for the, quote, sojourner who was living among them. That's the quote from Leviticus. So it's in those regulations it says all the men and people of Judea must do these things and the sojourner living among them. So it's a regulation from the law in the Old Testament, not only for the Jew, but for the Gentile living among them, which was the actual problem they were dealing with. So they composed a letter at this council, a document, a declaration written down by the apostles. And they put it in the hands of Paul and Barnabas and the others who had come from Antioch. And they sent with them some brethren who were of high authority in Jerusalem, who would be recognized in Antioch. And they go, and they go to Antioch up north, and they deliver the declaration of the council. And look what the council says. Verse 22. It seemed good to the apostles and the elders of the whole church. This is chapter 15, verse 22. For the whole church to choose men from among them to send them to Antioch. So they send them off, and this is what they wrote in their letter, verse 23. The brethren, both the apostles and the priests, to the brethren who are the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria, greetings. We've heard that there is problems among you. And they go on, they relate for them what they had just decided in that council. And they say that we discern this by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we expect you to obey what we say. What you have here in this narrative of this first apostolic council is the basic paradigm by which the church will resolve all of her problems throughout the last 2,000 years. There's a debate. Is Jesus really true God and true man? Debate. You say, well, of course. Well, you say, of course, because it's 2,000 years later. Really? Both God and man, how is this possible? So the council gathers together and they debate and discuss the issue and resolve it and figure it out. And the council of Nicaea, among all the councils since then, puts out a declaration guided and believed by those who attend uh, in attendance by the power of the Holy Spirit and binding upon all Christians in the church. This is an apostolic paradigm. Councils, church councils, the Holy Spirit, Binding, declarations, all that stuff comes right out of here, the earliest apostolic council. <clears throat> so, was St. Paul a Protestant? <laughs> As the email went out to you, what's this all about? Well, the reason why that title was given to you, first of all, maybe to raise your interest, let me see what it's all about. But often, when people talk about Paul, they almost Catholics almost associated with Protestantism. 
Because in the Pauline epistles, you hear so many passages that are oftentimes quoted against the apostolic church. Romans 3.28, Behold, a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. You Catholics in your good works. See? Galatians 2.16, and on, and on, and on, all these passages. All those quotes right out of the Pauline epistles. Paul was not a Protestant, but he was protesting something. He was not protesting the Church of Rome or faith versus good works. Paul was protesting the idea that Christian, Gentile Christians had to be circumcised and keep the kosher laws. And if you don't know that, and you read Paul's epistles outside of that historical context that we just saw in Acts the Apostles, you'll miss the point when he talks about works of the law, which is circumcision to keep the kosher laws, versus faith in Jesus. And faith in Jesus for Paul is not simply... I believe that Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. But faith in Jesus meant faith in Jesus and His law versus faith in the law of Moses. Two ways you can be saved in the period, in their understanding. Paul says, the only way you can be saved is not by the law of Moses, but the law of Jesus, the law of love, and the the apostolic preaching. Okay? So, the word faith... Works of the law has to be understood in a historical context. So let's look at a few examples of that. Romans 3.28 that we began with. Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Romans chapter 3, verse 28. For we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. You notice that's in the middle of a paragraph? Right? You think you want to read the whole paragraph, of course, right? Instead of just memorize this at Sunday school. So the paragraph is important. But not only that paragraph, but the entire epistle, the historical setting in which the epistle was composed. In fact, if you just expand yourself from that one verse and look at the paragraph, you see that there's some other strange language in here that clues you in that things aren't exactly what you might have thought it was about. Verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? Who's our Lord? That's Paul. He's a Jewish Christian. He's speaking to the Jewish Christians of Rome. What becomes of our boasting as Jewish Christians? Is it excluded? On what principle? On the principle of works? No. But on the principle of faith. For we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Now what does he mean and what is he discussing? He's not talking about an intellectual acceptance of Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior versus how you live your life. That comes 1,500 years later. But he's talking about this issue that you saw pervading Acts the Apostles. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? What separates Jews from Gentiles? It's not faith in Jesus versus a life of good works. What separates Jews from Gentiles and we just saw in Acts the Apostles Circumcision, kosher law, the laws of Moses. Yes, of the Gentiles also, since God is one and he will justify the circumcised on the ground of their faith and the uncircumcised through their faith. Do we overthrow the law by this faith? By no means we uphold it. He says the law of Moses is actually fulfilled in this, as all the prophets proclaim. So as you go through the Pauline epistles, and I've listed many of those key passages for you, you'll see a number of examples of this coming up. In fact, if you read through in the list that I have for you, Galatians 1 through 3, take Paul on circumcision. Okay? To understand Paul in Romans 3.28, you have to read the whole epistle, and it's a sort of context, in, part, in particular the whole narrative of that section. And in fact, something I highly recommend for you to do as you read through the Pauline epistles, get out a highlighter, pink, it's the color of flesh, and highlight every every time you see the word circumcision or uncircumcision. And you'll see that Paul's epistles are colored pink. And it, because this is something he was dealing with, or kosher, what you can and cannot eat, the law of Moses. Highlight that, another color. You'll start to find that this is, you'll realize you're highlighting it that pervades his epistles. 
And when you take one little verse about faith versus works of the law out of its context and read those terms in light of modern 2,000 years later debates about these issues, you completely misunderstand what he was talking about. So Galatians chapter uh, 2, same thing. You flip over a couple of epistles on the same issue. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, another memory verse you probably have heard. Yet we know that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Again, if you read the entire epistle, especially this section, you see it's a whole debate about who Peter's going to eat with at the meal in Antioch. The circumcised or the uncircumcised? They're not debating about faith in Jesus, intellectual faith in Jesus versus how I live my life. They're debating about do you accept Jesus as the Savior and the mediator of this new covenant? Or do you still rely on the laws of Moses and circumcision and kosher laws? Because, as Paul says, circumcision will not save you. Kosher laws will not save you. This is why the Messiah came, to save you. If kosher laws and circumcision could save you, there was no need of a Messiah. As he tells the Galatians later on this epistle, you who have been circumcised, Christians of Judea, of Galatia, who were all Gentiles, were beginning to be circumcised and keep the kosher laws. I said, oh, well, maybe, you know, backup plan just in case. <laughs> and Paul says to them in Galatians, verse, uh, uh, I'm sorry, verse 5, Paul says to the Galatian Christians, Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, For freedom Christ has set you free. Stand fast, therefore, and do do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is bound to keep the whole law. And Paul knows you can't keep the whole law. That was the debate in the church and among the Jews. How do you keep all of this? The Pharisees and the Sadducees are trying to resolve it. So he says, you Gentile Christians, any Jewish Christians in Galatia, if you submit to circumcision and to kosher laws and the keeping of the Jewish festival cycle, if you think that's going to save you, you don't have a chance. Because that's what the Christ came for. In fact, he says he's so angry. He converted all these Christians in Galatia. He says to them at the end, verse 12, chapter 5, verse 12, I wish those who would unsettle you would mutilate themselves. <laughs> he sees circumcision as mutilation, which it is. God created man in his own image likeness, and he was good. Circumcision is the mark of the covenant given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 7, 17. So, Again, read through Paul's epistles carefully. Highlight circumcision versus uncircumcision. And if you want to know what Paul thinks about how you live your life versus faith in Jesus Christ, there is no distinction for Paul. He says in this very chapter, in chapter 5, verse 16, chapter 5, verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh are against the spirit, and desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For there are, for these are opposed, and do each other to prevent one from doing what would. Verse 18. But if you are led by the spirit, the Christians of Galatia, and are not under the law, that is, under the law of Moses. Now, verse 19. The works of the flesh are plain. Immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, the party spirit. This doesn't mean beer bombs and things, but the party spirit to have distinctions, dis- uh, divisions among you. Envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So, far from the idea of Paul being this guy who advocates faith in Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, versus how you live your life and your soup kitchens, you Catholics. This is not what Paul was dealing with. On the contrary, Paul was dealing with the historical say in the day. And Paul was preaching the apostolic gospel that you have received as Catholics. Read his epistles. Read them in the historical contexts. 
Why? Because you love God and you want to keep his commandments. Round heart. All right, so we'll take a, a five, ten minute break, and then anyone who wants to stay for question and answers, I'll be here. Otherwise, for you. But please, read Acts. One question that was just asked in the hallway that is relevant is the uh, law of Moses. When I, we kept talking about the law of Moses, typically as a Christian, you think of the Ten Commandments. The law of Moses for the Jews, the law, was what we call the Pentateuch or the Torah, the five books of Moses. You can see that distinction in the New Testament, there are examples, to fulfill the law and the prophets. The two divisions of the Word of God, or the, what we call the Old Testament for the Jew, was the law, what Moses gave us, what we call the Pentateuch today, or the Torah, the books of Moses, and the prophets, that is, everything else, right? And then thrown in there, they included all the wisdom literature and things like that. Solomon, David, they were called prophets for them because they gave you the Word of God. So. What we have today, the, the division of wisdom literature and the psalm, the historical books. For them, there was the law of the prophets. So when you talk about the law that Moses gave, they, they mean the whole story. So Abraham gave you circumcision, or God gave you circumcision for Abraham, but Moses gave you circumcision. You'll hear this language in the debate. Jesus will say this. Uh, about being circumcised and the debate about is this from Moses? Well, no, Moses didn't give you this. But so you, Moses, the law, the law of Moses, the Pentateuch, circumcision that comes in Genesis 17, long before Moses ever would have existed. Uh, the um, uh, whether or not you could eat blood, that comes back. That's given through Noah after the flood. So a lot of the laws that you associate with the law of Moses or the Jews, it's from not only just the Ten Commandments, but the whole story. But anyway, it comes out of Leviticus, the kosher laws and things like that. Okay? So that's very helpful as you're reading through and remember that. And again, that's in the notes there in the section on chapter 15 of Acts. There's a little section that discusses that issue. Okay? Question? Yeah. Yes? This is just a paradigm question. When you're talking about reading through Acts, and reading it three times, what's the time frame you're thinking? Is it like once a week, or how long do you think it takes to kind of... Depends on what your workload is, and family, and kids, and whatever you're doing, you know? Ideally, I mean, Acts is, it's a good book, you know, a good length of a book, but it's not something you couldn't get through in a couple of days, you know, depending on how much time you have, one day if you got the time. So, well, I would suggest a reading plan if you're planning on reading Paul's epistles this year, which I highly recommend, well, I'm reading the whole Bible, of course, is uh, read through Acts, from, you know, cover to cover, yeah. at least once before you right. jump into the Pauline epistles. Right. And then on the second read through Acts, or if you have, depends on how much time you have, you know, three or four, third or fourth read through Acts, then start reading Paul's epistles, but again, read them in that historical right. order. You know, where they were written. Okay. To do that, for the most part, you have on chapter, was it the second or third page of the notes where I say you know, what journeys, where he was when he wrote it. So as you're following along in those journeys, and he, you know, and he gets to say Corinth on that second journey, that's when you read first and Thessalonians. And you'll understand why he's saying what he's saying in, to the Thessalonians, because you just read about him in Thessalonica and what happened when he was there. Okay? Do you recommend it also for? So I'm in Terry in another parish. If I'm if I'm taking a group through the Pauline Epistles for the year, would you also recommend that for a Acts the Apostles? Well, a teaching method. So say, yeah, we're gonna go through this and. Yes, and I was going to suggest this. If you want to email me, I'll give you some a reading plan written down about that. That would be great. Thank you. <laughs> now, if I get a bulk mail by which I'm able to trace your name because of this email, I will kill you. So, <laughs> don't put this email. Don't spread this email out and don't let me get into some bulk mail list. Uh, this, my, my, my mother did this once. So, 
This email is only for you sitting here to send me a personal email if you need to. About the topic, okay? So you can write it. It better be just me being sent the email. No bulk mails, okay? And I don't get to email very often, every couple weeks sometimes, so it might take a while. But if you send me an email, just my name at email.com, I will send you if you need maybe a reading list. I can send you my lecture notes on Paul or on Acts. And that will help you go through the Acts of the Apostles. But it's like, I don't know, it's like eight pages or something. So I couldn't, we couldn't see our whole yeah, thing. Yeah. But actually, the notes you have here is part of that, part of those lecture notes. So if you want a reading plan of how to go through Acts and Paul at the same time. Okay. I would like to have the reading plan to write. I would like to have the reading plan to. Yes, that's it. My email. So, so send me an email. Okay. Direct question of what it is, and I'll send you this. But make sure you've ruined your inbox because it's a big attachment. Why is it? Why is the phone going to not eat bread? Why did what? Why are they not allowed to eat bread? Bratwurst. Like, come on, bratwurst is so good, right? Why not? Why not eating blood? Noah was told that they could not eat animals with their blood in them. That was the life, right? You see that there in Genesis. Is it because of hygiene? Stuff? No. Um, the reason is is because blood is the symbol of life. Okay, in the Old Testament and in the New, right? You slit someone's throat, the blood comes out, they're dead. And so in the ancient world, when you sacrificed an animal, especially the Jewish method, you held it there standing up, you slit its throat, or you're just going to eat it, you're going to butcher it, you slit its throat, and the blood all pumps out. The animal's still alive, the heart's still beating. I hope none of you, uh, your stomach's turned before lunch. All the blood pumps out, and then the animal falls over. That's dead. So there's an intimate association between blood and life in the Bible. It's a real association, right? Mm -hmm. So the blood is a symbol of the life of the animal, but in the pagan world, they actually believed that the blood itself contained the life force, the power. And so among the pagans, sacrifices oftentimes entail also the drinking of the animal's blood, right? Uh, if you want to take the power of the bull, well, you slit its throat, you drink its blood, and you drink it. And then you'll have the power of the bull in you. His blood is life force. And unfortunately for the bull, he's dead, but now you've got his life. Do you remember the movie Red Dawn? The movie Red Dawn. They, there's an episode where there is some boys in Montana and they shoot a deer. And the deer dies and one of the friends says, is this your first deer? He says, yeah. And they cut his throat the blood came out. They put it in a cup and he drank it. He says, now you're the strength of the deer. So, pagan is a light and little Montana. So, <laughs> no, but it's an, it's an ancient understanding. And so God told the Jews, or the Israelites, his own people, the sons of Abraham, they could not eat blood that is involved in these pagans because they were not in the image and likeness of animals. They were in the image and likeness of God, and the animals were created underneath them, below them, and they were to be over them. The pagan world constantly associated itself with the animals and the creation. God's own people were constantly called to remember that they were not like the other animals, but they were created in the image and likeness of God. And the only blood they could ever drink was that of God. That comes in the New Testament. But the Asian, they, they literally coated by blood. The what? Well cooked. I mean, the Asian, like they, I mean, uh, Yes, it's okay to drink blood today. Bratwurst, it's fine. There's no problem. Because you don't eat bratwurst and think, gosh, man, I'm going to get the strength of a bratwurst is out of a cow or something. There's no association with that right now. But if you were eating bratwurst because you thought you were going to become have a life force of a hog or something, that would be paganism and would be sin. But you don't do that for those reasons. But the pagan world is, okay? It's a silly question, but can you talk a little bit about how like, his letters to the Thessalonians and Galatians would have been disseminated out? The letter to the Thessalonians, the first record of this kind of thing, was Timothy, the courier. Once he gets there, though, how is that word spread? No, it's not clear. You'd expect Timothy, you know, Paul rolled it up, sealed it, handed it to Timothy. Timothy got on a boat or sailed, depending on how he got back up to Thessalonica. And when he arrived in Thessalonica, he would have arrived at the church and probably waited till Sunday, till everyone had got there, and then presented all the information to him about what Paul had said uh, during the sermon, during the homily part. They'd all gather together and then, oh, oh by the way, Timothy's here. Oh, great, I wonder if he has any news. I don't know where this begins. So they begin the ceremony, the Last Supper, or the, the, the Supper of our Lord, uh, which was basically a Passover supper, and do what Jesus had said to do. They'd break the bread, drink the wine, and 
then there's a homo. And Timothy probably stood up at that point and said, uh, you guys all know that there was some debate about these things. I just got back. This is what Paul says. Unrolls it and reads it. Uh, and then it would have been kept as a treasure in there in this church of the Thessalonica. But also you'd expect copies would have started to be made. But we do see Paul seeing his letters as being spread over greater regions in his letter to the Galatians. His letter to the Galatians, Galatia is a whole region of Asia Minor. And he wrote this as a letter that he must have expected in some way to be copied many times and passed you know, along from church to church, Lystra, Derbe, Iconium, things like that. But there's no regulations on exactly how he used to do it that I know of. I can think of it on my head. Are all of Paul's letters, his original letters, still in existence in one place? When you read 1 Corinthians, you hear of a letter that he had written before to them. We don't know what happened to that letter. Some have theorized that the letter that was 1 Corinthians, that is the first thing he ever wrote to them, has become part of the final text of 1 Corinthians as we have it, but we don't know. But he does say halfway through his first letter to the Corinthians, he says, as I wrote to you in the previous letter, what previous letter? This is the 1 Corinthians. There's no for me. Well, he had obviously written something else. And there's probably, who knows, maybe 10, 20 letters of Paul that you know, this is a guy probably on a daily basis would have written a note off to somebody, you know, sending emails everywhere. So we don't know what happened to all of those, but you you would hope that some of them have been become part of the text, the final text of things like first or second Corinthians. Okay. Now some people accuse Paul being sexist, and how do I explain it to them? That is part of the misunderstanding of Paul's language. He's using language that, again, is in the cultural setting and is based intimately in the creation story in Genesis 1 through 3. So when you read Paul's epistles outside of the cultural linguistic setting, which he proposed these things about men and women, the relationship, you totally misunderstand what he's saying. Like, he doesn't want women to speak in public, right, in the churches. Why? Oh, he just doesn't think women have anything to say. Well, well, no, because the woman is part of the body of the man. And if she speaks in public instead of her husband, it disrupts the relationship. The man is the head, the woman is the body, as he explains in Ephesians chapter 5, which comes right out of Genesis chapter 2. Eve came from the body of Adam. Right? So it's not that Paul has anything against women. In fact, he has. there are women in the Pauline churches preaching and prophesying with veils on in Corinth when he discusses the issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <coughs> But, again, these are, in fact, I think, you're going to have a talk on this, Theology of the Body and all that? Yeah, I'm going to give a talk, I think it's the third Sunday in September at a local parish on St. Paul and women. So, so the very question he's going to deal with, it's just something there's a lot of But Paul is far from sexist, and you'll see oh, reasons in the proper context, just as Paul was not a Baptist. He also was not sexist. <laughs> Yeah, sure. That talk would be a great talk to attend. Yes. We'll make this the final question, and then you can break up anything else you want to ask in private so that we can be free to go. Okay. Maybe it's like the people don't want to kind of worry about circumcision, but it seems like the Jewish and Christians still today, for the most part, give their children circumcised. So back then, were they still getting their children circumcised? Poor Paul. He probably rolls over his grave. Or some Christians don't know. Christians today in America, in Western countries primarily, in Northern America, this is, you go down to Mexico, and they have a certain types of points. But um, in America, in Western medicine, primarily in the U.S., coming out of Northern Europe and England, in the medical field, uh, uses circumcision for uh, health issues. And the issue, of course, you know, is debated about what are the health advantages. There are, it's been documented statistically, lesser chances of certain diseases, fungal infections, things like that, um, in, an un, in a circumcised male as opposed to an uncircumcised male. But even that is debated about the, you know, the pros and cons about causing that kind of injury to a child at early age. So, but that is not happening for um, for religious reasons. It's happening because of a medical issue. And Paul says clearly, circumcision, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters at all, but faith in Jesus Christ. So, you know, if your son was circumcised or whatever, or men here, I'm not going to ask any questions. It has nothing to do with the issue. Unless you are being circumcised or you're having your son circumcised because you want to keep the Mosaic law, and then you've got a massive problem. And I recommend talking to your priest. 
<laughs> Any professional. All right. <laughs> okay? All right, so let's break up now. If there's any questions, if you have any further questions, I'll just stay for another half an hour. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.